Welcome everybody to our weekly Bible study. We've had technical difficulties followed by uh, scheduling difficulties, so we've been gone for a couple of weeks. Uh, but we will be back, hopefully streaming live, this Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern. And then the archive usually goes up the next morning. So we're trying to work on a better schedule, but uh, we're still learning all this, how to stream and how to podcast and all of that. So bear with us. We are in Acts 19 tonight. And so let's start with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word for this book of Acts. We ask that you would open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to your truth, Lord. We thank you for providing us with your word and look forward to this study and as always tomorrow with you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you have your Bibles with you, turn to Acts chapter 19, verse 1. <clears throat> And we will start. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus. And finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, Unto what then were you baptized? And they said, Into John's baptism. Then said Paul, John, verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him, which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. And all the men were about twelve. And he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. But when the Jews were hardened against him and believed not, but spoke evil of the way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. And this continued by the space of two years, so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. And so, <clears throat> so in verse 3, Paul asks believers, into what then were you baptized? So what does that mean? Again, there was no internet back then, no broadcast communications, and so that even people who had heard and believed and been either baptized by John himself, or they had heard from one of John's disciples and been baptized right there in Ephesus, if they had remained in Ephesus, and depending on who they talked to, they may not have heard all that had happened since John was baptizing, and that appears to be what we see here again. And so Paul's going to baptize them again. Why? Because he's going to baptize them into something different. Something new. Now, not something foreign to John or the, the gospel that John preached or the baptism of John. But he was going to baptize them into that gospel that John preached about. From verse 4, him who would come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. So this again is a person who had heard and understood the gospel more recently and more fully. As we read in chapter 18, more accurately, just as the disciples had preached the gospel more accurately to Apollos, Priscilla and Aquila, I think it was, who preached the gospel more accurately to Apollos. Paul here is preaching the gospel more accurately to these believers, showing other believers the fullness of the unfolding revelation of Jesus Christ. From John's baptism of repentance, now 
to Paul's gospel of salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And notice here we have the laying on of hands after which the Holy Spirit came upon them. And that we have the baptism and we have the speaking in tongues. These were the sign gifts that followed Paul and the other apostles that were given by God as a means of confirming the apostles' credentials to speak. The credentials that God gave them so that people would believe and could be confident that they were apostles from God. So God gave them certain signs and wonders that followed them. And as we proceed through the time of Paul's ministry, we will see that these sign gifts eventually ceased. By Paul's second letter to Timothy, we read that, quote, Erastus stayed at Corinth, but Trophimus I have left in Miletus sick. 2 Timothy 4.20. Well, why didn't Paul heal Trophimus? Why would he leave him in Miletus sick? He could heal him, right? No. I'm persuaded that by the end of his ministry, Paul no longer had the sign gifts like tongues and miracles and healings because they were given to serve the purpose of of credentialing him as an apostle of Jesus Christ, as a prophet of the living God. But we will see that, uh, and have seen, that signs and wonders do not generally bring people to faith. Uh, And in verse 8, Paul goes back to the synagogue, but he ends up taking up uh, a room in what was likely a Greek secular school called the School of Tyrannus. And from there, he preached primarily, we assume, to a Gentile audience, or at least from a place where he was free of being accused of profaning a Jewish establishment with this strange gospel about the Messiah that the Jews were still looking for, but that Paul was insisting had already come and been crucified and raised from the dead. Believe, and you'll be saved. And the Jews didn't like to hear that. And for two years, it says, Paul preached daily from the school of Tyrannus until all who dwelt in Asia heard the word, both Jews and Greeks. Earlier we heard that the the Holy Spirit had, had directed Paul away from Asia, but now Paul has made it into Asia and has preached the word for three years. We pick up now again in Acts chapter 19 and verse 11. Now, God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick and the diseases left them and the evil spirits went out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits. We exorcise you by the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, they would say. (laughs) Also, there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, who did so. And the evil spirits answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? And then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. This became known to both all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. Also many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. And so the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. And so, uh, here in Acts 19, Paul has been preaching for the better part of 15 years. uh, Maybe a bit longer. And he still has the sign gifts. And as we just saw, when he got to Ephesus, there were still many people, even the faithful, who hadn't heard the gospel. And so God kept the credentials of the miraculous with Paul as a sign, as a credential. And it's interesting here how people respond to the testimony um, of a demon. Uh, The demon here abused the seven sons of Sceva, and the terror of that testimony was so powerful that by the end of the section, we read that the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. (laughs) Um, And that's good writing, by the way, how Luke tells of the demon prevailing over the seven sons of Sceva. But by the end of the section, it's the word of the Lord that grows mighty and prevailed. 
Now, Luke's a good writer. Um, and then there's the book burning. The, the book burning, which when we hear about book burning, we tend to think of the more recent examples of um, like Adolf Hitler, the Hitler Youth, or Chairman Mao's cultural revolutionaries coming together and burning any books that might disagree with their tyranny. But here, the book burning is voluntary, and it's people burning their own private property. And books were quite valuable in those days, by the way. It's not like today. Books were very expensive. So this was a show of the power of the gospel over the former power that these pagan religious texts had had over these people. They were so now dedicated to the gospel of Christ that they would burn these valuable books. And they weren't burning other people's books. And they weren't telling anyone they had to burn any books. So this was a good book burning. And so, uh, and, and, and so who was Sceva, by the way? And, and how could a Jewish chief priest be in Ephesus, which is a Greek city? Aren't the chief priests in Jerusalem? I mean, I remember hearing about the chief priests in Jerusalem during the ministry of Christ. And so I asked myself that question as, as I was reading, and it led me to look into the idea of the position of the chief priest. That led me to the high priest. And so if you'll turn to Leviticus chapter 21 and verse 1, uh, that's Leviticus chapter 1. I'm sorry, uh, Leviticus chapter 21, verse 1. we'll find out that uh, that the position of chief priest, well, let's start with the high priest, because the, the position of chief priest seems to be more uh, just a traditional construct because the Hebrews tended to refer to chiefs of households and uh, chiefs of his father's household. So chief was a member of the community who was held in some esteem. He became a chief, whatever. And so chief priest wasn't really a, a, a title or a position that was created by God in the priesthood, which that's what I thought it was. Uh, but it turns out um, there is no position of chief priest in the law. The position, again, appears to be a, a, a political or social construct. There might have been a... a there might have been a, a chief tent maker and a chief butcher and a chief priest was a, a head of a family household who happened to be a chief or held in high esteem. But there was no position of chief priest. Um, and there were a lot of chief priests, apparently some of them good, some of them bad. But it was not a position created by God in his church, which was a surprise to me just because I had never looked into it. Um, now, there is a position of high priest described in the law. And again, Leviticus 21.1, if you found it. And the Lord said to Moses, Speak to the priests, the sons of Aaron, and say to them, None shall defile himself for the dead among his people except for his relatives who are nearest him, his mother, his father, etc. And so we can tell by this context that this is a command of Moses on how God's church is to be established and function. This is the Hebrew church, the Jewish church. Uh, and we read here that a priest cannot go out to a funeral for anyone except his close relatives because he would be ceremonially unclean to go around a dead body. And that's only to be allowed for specific situations, only close relatives for the priest. And then, Levitic, Levit, and then Leviticus gets even more specific. In 21.10, Moses commanded, He who is the high priest among his brethren, on whose head the anointing oil was poured, and who is consecrated to wear the garments, shall not uncover his head nor tear his clothes nor shall he go near any dead body, nor defile himself for his father or his mother, nor shall he go out of the sanctuary, nor profane the sanctuary of his God, for the consecration of the anointing oil of his God is upon him, I am the Lord. So unlike chief priests, which seems to be just a 
a social construct. High priest is named here. So this is a position of authority established by God. And so now if you'll turn back to Exodus chapter 29, Exodus chapter 29, after the very first consecration of the high priest in the wilderness, which, by the way, that was Aaron himself, who is the father of the priestly order, along with his sons, we read here in Exodus 29, uh, verse 29, Moses commands, And the holy garments of Aaron shall be his sons after him to be anointed in them and to be consecrated in them. That son who becomes priest in his place shall put them on for seven days when he enters the tabernacle of meeting to minister in the holy place. So notice how this is constructed. In Leviticus 21.10, it said, He who is the high priest among his brethren, high priest among his brethren, shall not go out of the sanctuary. Not even to, not to defile himself or his mother or father. He can't go to his mother or father's funeral. And then it says, nor shall he go out of the sanctuary. And so, does that mean the high priest can never leave the sanctuary? Or is that just reiterating that he can't leave for his mother or father's funeral? I'm not sure. But that was my first indication that perhaps this... I had always assumed the high priest was appointed priest for life. I'm not sure why I assume that, but that's what I always assumed. That's what I had assumed. Well, this made me think, well, perhaps not. Um, and then when we read on, that son who becomes priest in Aaron's place here in Leviticus 29, 29. It doesn't say the son who becomes high priest in his place. It says the son who becomes priest in his place shall put on Aaron's garments for seven days when he enters the tabernacle of meeting to minister in the holy place. And so, what is the high priest? Is this a lifelong appointment? Or that's what I had assumed it was. Well, here's what I've found, and I welcome anyone's thoughts because it's a lot murkier than I had anticipated. The office of priest was obviously hereditary, as only the sons of Aaron were supposed to be priests, just as only the sons of Levi were supposed to enter service to the uh, enter, enter in service to the priests as Levites. But the office of high priest is not specifically described in the law as definitively as I would have thought. So we learn that in the time of David, David set up the tabernacle in Shiloh and he established the 24 orders of the priesthood. Well, that happened 435 years after the priesthood was established in the wilderness. And now these 24 orders of priests, as they were chosen by King David in Shiloh, 435 years after the priests were established, the 24 orders of priests were intended to serve one week at a time, twice a year. And whichever order was serving on the Day of Atonement, I think it's possible that the priest scheduled to enter the holy place on that day would be anointed with oil and would enter the holy place and then enter the holy of holies as high priest. So I think it's possible that the position of high priest was intended to last just that week, maybe just that day, or the high priest who went into the Holy of Holies once a year, that's the only time he was high priest, was when he went in there. And, and it's quite possible that the priest intended to go into the Holy of Holies was not allowed to leave even the holy place for a week. In the temple, you have the, the outer areas, and then you have the holy place where the priests minister and burn incense. And then you have the Holy of Holies inside where we have the Ark of the Covenant, and, and a priest only went in there once a year. And he was anointed with oil as high priest and went in. 
And so it's also possible that someone was anointed with oil for that week and stayed in the holy place. And that's when he was high priest, that, that the office lasted a week. Because a new group of priests would come every week. And, and this was my thought because as I read Leviticus 21.10, that it's possible that God stated the high priest is not allowed to leave the sanctuary at all. It, that's if we're understanding the translation properly, and it's possible that I'm not. It's possible that the translation could have been different. But I think that's a possibility. Or perhaps that the one... It's, it's also possible, I think, that the one who was high priest on the Day of Atonement may have served in that office for a year. Maybe. And I state this only as a possibility because of the curious wording surrounding Caiaphas in the book of John. And this only appears three times, uh, as far as I can tell in my, in my exhaustive search, a word search through the Bible. I can't find this any other place. But in John eleven forty nine, 49, uh, the author says, And one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said to them, Consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people. One of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year. John eleven fifty one. 51. Now this he did not say on his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. And then finally in John, in John 18, John 18, 13. And they led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. This is the only place in the Bible where it mentions that someone was high priest that year, and I don't understand why it would say that year unless it was a yearly office. So that led me to the possibility that maybe the high priest who goes into the Holy Holies, the Holy of Holies, on the Day of Atonement, perhaps he was intended to be high priest for a year, and there were other administrative things that he did. Possible. One thing I'm, I'm certain of, is that the position of high priest was never intended as a religious position under which the high priest would accumulate wealth and power. That I'm certain of. Um, and I'm not so certain now that it was ever even intended to be uh, a religious position assumed for life, like a king. I'm not so sure of that now. Um, it may have been initiated as a seven-day duty that each, each priest would assume in due time according to the order of the priestly service. That maybe, or even a day, just when you were in the Holy of Holies. I think that's possible too. Um, or uh, year by year, the priest who entered the Holy of Holies on the, on the Day of Atonement may have held that position for a year. But it was never meant... As well, let me just go through some of the things. I, so, Numbers 27, when Numbers chapter 20, verse 7, if you have your Bibles, you can go there. This is when Moses transferred the priesthood from Aaron to his son Eleazar. Aaron was told, You're not going to enter the promised land. And it's really odd that he was told that. He would not be allowed to enter the promised land, not because he set up the golden calf, which to me seems pretty bad. But that's not why God said you're not going to be allowed into the Holy Land, Aaron. You're not going to be allowed into the Holy Land because you and Moses struck the rock. So the striking of the rock, Moses' disobedience, apparently was more significant to God than Aaron setting up the golden calf and that whole incident, which is interesting to me. Um, but God tells him, you're not going in. In fact, here we go, Numbers 20, verse 7. And they went up to Mount Hor in the sight of all the congregation. Moses stripped Aaron of his garments and put them on Eleazar, his son. And Aaron died there on top of the mountain. And Moses and Eleazar came down from the mountain. So when I read this, I thought, well, certainly the, the priesthood was transferred from Aaron to his son. Does that mean the high priest 
priesthood. The high priesthood went from Aaron to his son for life. Well, I remembered that when Moses was anointed as the high priest in the wilderness to to, um, sanctify the tabernacle, Moses anointed him with oil. He poured oil on his head. He didn't just put the garments on him. He poured the oil. And here, Moses did not anoint Eleazar with oil to make him high priest. He simply took the priesthood from Aaron and gave it to his sons, it appears to me. And he gave it to his eldest son because that would have been the tradition in, in uh, Hebrew life that the, the eldest son inherited from his father. But it just doesn't seem like he inherited the high priesthood to me. Just the priesthood. 1 Samuel 16, 13. Here's what it looks like when someone is anointed to a lifetime position. 1 Samuel 16, 13. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed David in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So when the king was anointed for life, the oil was poured. When the high priest was anointed to to sanctify the tabernacle, or oil was poured to make him high priest. When Eleazar took the priesthood from his father, there was no anointing with oil. So that's an indication to me that, that, that the high priesthood was not being transferred, merely the priesthood. Exodus 28, 4. Moses instructed, So they shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, and his sons, that he may minister to me as priest. It talks about the priesthood in the singular as Aaron, but it talks about his sons, and not that he may minister, Aaron may minister to me as high priest, but that he may minister to me as priest. Aaron may or may not have been the high priest, I contend, depending on the order of service that was established in the wilderness. Exodus 35, 19, the holy garments for Aaron the priest and the garments of his sons to minister as priests. These are the instructions for making the garments. And it, and it notes that Aaron is the priest, not the high priest. Leviticus 16.32 relays the instructions for the, the Day of Atonement. Leviticus 16.32, And the priest who is anointed and consecrated to minister as priest in his father's place shall make atonement and put on the linen clothes, the holy garments. Then he shall make atonement for the holy sanctuary. He shall make atonement for the tabernacle of meeting and for the altar. And he shall make atonement for the priests and all of the people of the assembly. But then the order of the priests is not determined outside of Aaron and his sons, as best I can tell, until King David, 435 years later. And in this section on the Day of Atonement, everyone is called a priest. And the, and the, and the sons are anointed and consecrated to minister as priest in his father's place. So Aaron, again, is the singular reference to the priesthood, but he's not necessarily always called the high priest. And then David selects the divisions, and he selects them by lot, as we would expect, right? And the first lot fell on Jehoiarib, the second on on Jediah, the third on Harim, the fourth on Seorim, the fifth to Malchijah, the sixth to Majamin, the seventh to Hakaz, the eighth to Abijah, the ninth to Yeshua, the tenth to Shechaniah, the eleventh to Eliashib, the twelfth to Jakim, the thirteenth to Hupa, the fourteenth to Jeshabiab, the fifteenth to Bilgah, the sixteenth to Immer, the seventeenth to Hazir, the eighteenth to Hapazez, the nineteenth to Pethahiah, the twentieth to Jezekel, Jehezekel, the twenty-first to Jakim, the twenty-second to Gamul, the twenty-third to Deliah, the 24th to Maaziah. This was the schedule of their service for coming into the house of the Lord according to their ordinance by the hand of Aaron their father, as the Lord God of Israel had commanded him. So no one was chosen as high priest when David selected the order. No one was designated or anointed with oil. And so now the the position of king reigning for life to be fulfilled by the king's son upon his death 
is a position of authority ordained by God, at least for Israel. Um, and you can hear it from Moses himself speaking directly for, for God. In Exodus 17, starting in verse 14, when Moses said, When you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you and possess it and dwell in it, and say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me, you shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses. So a king is appointed as king over Israel by God. So God likes the idea of an authority that is hereditary, passed down to the son in, in military and politics. And in the case of Israel, the king is the head of the church. It's a theocracy. But I would, I would contend that had David, had there been a position of high priest that was ordained for life, then David would have chosen one here, and he did not. And so I don't think this, the, the office of high priest was intended for life. Um, we know Jesus is the king. We know that uh, David was king. We know that God likes the monarchy. He wants us to have a king. Um, he calls his son a king in, in the wilderness. God told people he would appoint a king over them. And so the concept of, of a monarchy is biblical, biblically correct. It's, it's a biblically ordained concept, at least for Israel. By the way, it's the only form of government that is specifically approved of by God in the Bible. Um, now, there are all kinds of kings in the Bible and even to this day who hate God. Um, but the position of authority, the office, so to speak, is a legitimate office. And it's a lifetime office, and it's inherited from one's father. The high priest, I think, is not such an office. Um, but we shall see that it obviously became that. It became such an office. And we'll get back to that. But what about the chief priests? The chief priests. Here in Acts 19, we have the seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priests. And again, I think it's just something that, uh, it's a cultural statement, it's not really a position, but it's, uh, well, we've seen from the law that the high priest is an office assumed for some time by one of the priests of Israel, and, that, and it definitely began, began with Aaron and his sons, and then, their, and then their sons after them. The priesthood is an office like the monarchy. Both are recognized by God as legitimate seats of authority, the monarchy for political and military authority, the, the priesthood for religious authority. But there's a difference in how God allots religious authority in that it seems He does not allow supreme religious authority to rest upon any man for longer than perhaps a year, maybe only a week, maybe only a day when He's in the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement. And so it appears from the Scripture that any designation of or assumption of religious authority by any one man for any significant period of time, for life at least, appears to me to be doctrinally unsound and unbiblical. And so how is it that there came to be an office of the high priest and even a palace of the high priest? How did that happen? I mean, we read in Israel, I'm sorry, we read... In Matthew 26, 3, <clears throat> that the high priest had a palace. How does that happen? Well, because God's chosen people rarely did what they were told. They rarely followed God. They rarely listened to God. They rarely listened to the prophets. They stoned the prophets. They killed the prophets. They murdered the prophets and one another. They almost always just did what they wanted and then they dressed it up as if it was God's idea. And unless one takes the time to study it, it's easy to assume, like I had, that the high priest reigned in the temple according to the law. But the idea of a high priest for life, or even as a religious office for life, was, I think, profane. And in in almost all times and all cases in Israel, it was sinful. It was religious leaders disobeying God and manipulating the people for their own advantage and their own power and their own wealth. Gee, does that sound familiar? 
It sounds like all of human history. Not unique to the Jews, by the way. Now let's turn to Numbers 35, 9. Numbers 35 and chapter 9, if you have your Bible with you. Because when I realized that the priest, that, that, that chief priest wasn't even an office, seems to be a social construct, a political construct, the office of high priest is definitely not what I thought it was. It's definitely not what it became when Jesus came to the earth. It's not what it, the way it was intended. So the discovery of these things that I was not aware of previously, um, it led me to another passage that might seem at first blush to have been given to Israel only as moral instruction. But upon further review, it becomes obvious that the passage cannot only be moral instruction. And so we've got to take a look and try to figure out what it is. And it's the passage regarding the cities of refuge in Numbers chapter 35, starting in verse 9. We read, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you cross into the Jordan, the land of Canaan, you shall appoint cities to be cities of refuge for you, that the manslayer who kills any person accidentally may flee there. They shall be cities of refuge for you from the avenger of blood, that the manslayer may not die until he stands before the congregation in judgment. <clears throat> and then Moses goes on now then to give detailed descriptions of what might be considered accidental and what might be considered intentional homicide. And then we pick it back up in verse 24 with what's supposed to happen after a finding of unintentional homicide. Moses says, Then the congregation shall judge between the manslayer and the avenger of blood according to these judgments. So the congregation shall deliver the manslayer from the hand of the avenger of blood, and the congregation shall return into the city of refuge where he had fled, and he shall remain there until the death of the high priest who was anointed with the holy oil. But if the manslayer at any time goes outside the limits of the city of refuge where he fled, and the avenger of blood finds him outside the limits of his city of refuge, and the avenger of blood kills the manslayer, he, the avenger of blood, shall not be guilty of blood. Because the manslayer should have remained in his city of refuge until the death of the high priest. But after the death of the high priest, the manslayer may return to the land of his possession. So, so there's a practical application to the instruction in the law in uh, keeping someone who's accidentally killed another person separated from family members who might want to kill him for what he's done. That, that would be the avenger of blood. And that separation would likely last for a good while uh, until the death of the high priest who was serving at, as high priest at the time of the judgment. See, I had always assumed... That meant the death of whoever was high priest because it was a lifelong office. But if you read the, the instruction in the law, it says whoever was anointed with the oil, apparently at the time the judgment is made that this was unintentional homicide. When that guy dies, which is still going to be a pretty long time, chances are. So it keeps, the, it keeps the, the offended parties separate. So that's the practical application. Um. But why would the death of the high priest signal that the person guilty of unintentional homicide can now go free? And why is it that the avenger of blood could be called not guilty for killing a man who'd been found not guilty of murder simply because that man disobeyed this law? How is it that he could be called not guilty? Because we know that well, here you go. We know that God commanded the death penalty for working on the Sabbath, right? So God has the authority to enforce even a symbolic law with capital punishment, right? So picking up sticks on Saturday is not inherently evil. It's only because God said you shall not work on Saturday or the penalty is death. That's the only reason there's a penalty for that. It's an arbitrary symbolic law that God instructed and gave to Israel, and then He showed them that He would actually enforce the death penalty against it when He killed the fellow in the wilderness who picked up sticks on Saturday. So God has that authority. And so we have to look for the symbol here. What could this mean symbolically, and how could that symbol fit with prophecy, history, people, personalities? And how could it help us understand reality? And for the Jewish believer who was reading this instruction 3,000 years ago, 
How could the symbol help them understand prophecies of what was coming in the future? So just as God has the authority to impose the death penalty for a symbolic law or for something that's not inherently evil, just by declaring it, God also has authority to declare a man righteous if he has killed an innocent person. That, that's, the, that's the lesson that God is teaching Israel is that I have the ability to forgive sin. I can forgive a guilty man and call him as if he's innocent. The avenger of blood could have killed a man found not guilty of a capital crime and God could hold the avenger of blood guiltless. God apparently has the authority to forgive sin. And in this case, notice, he does so without the necessity of a sacrifice. Without a blood sacrifice, God declares the avenger of blood not guilty. Well, every Jew knew at this time, in order to be forgiven of your sins, you have to offer a sacrifice. Those were the instructions of the law, but here God violates that. He just declares him not guilty, and there, there is no blood sacrifice required from him. But the Jewish scholar might just ask, how could God make such a, de a declaration without following his own law? How could he do this without a sacrifice for sin? And this is where the Jewish scholar, 3,000 years ago, might have begun to understand the necessity of the suffering and the sacrifice of the Messiah that the Messiah would be the high priest who had to be the sacrifice himself for that sin. Because it's understood in Jewish tradition that the promise made by God to Eve, that from her seed would come a man who would save the world from their sins, who would save the world from the devil, that was the promise of the Messiah. That's the promise of the Savior. That's the Messiah that the Jews were looking for. And wise men and Hebrew scholars have been looking for their Messiah ever since. Now, for me and you, looking backward and having the entirety of the Scripture in front of us, have the cross behind us, right? All of history behind us and the Bible in front of us. We can see now that this passage in Numbers is speaking of the Messiah. He is the anointed priest. Once he died, his death set the captives free. And he became the sacrifice necessary to forgive sin. This is symbolic of our salvation by Jesus Christ. And if the religious scholars of their day had not kept the scriptures from the people and twisted them and lied about them, in order to lord it over them and make money and, and, and accumulate power, then the people may have more clearly seen when their Messiah indeed came. They may have seen it more clearly had the church of their day been more loyal to God and more loyal to the truth and actually seeking God rather than seeking their own power, their own money, their own pleasure, their own ambition. But Matthew 26 tells us who was in the palace of the high priest at the time. It tells us there was a palace. That right there is a red flag, I think. Here, and from Matthew 26, <clears throat> starting in verse 3, Then the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders of the people assembled, assembled in the palace of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas, and plotted to take Jesus by trickery and kill him. The high priest was called Caiaphas, by the way. Not the high priest Caiaphas. And I think that's just a, a literary slight where it says the high priest who was called Caiaphas. Because Caiaphas was not actually God's high priest. He held the title, but he was a liar. He was a fake. He was a poser. He was an opportunist. And so by the time the Messiah came, the offices established by, by God had been so corrupted and perverted by men, the chosen people, by the way, the chosen people had so corrupted God's ordained authorities 
that those very offices were turned against the Messiah by the office holders and used to murder the anointed high priest. And behind all of this corruption was Satan. Satan is a, a genuinely real force. Satan is an individual, a demonic fallen angel who exists. He's not a myth. He's not an analogy to help us understand that there's good and bad in the world. Satan is an individual. He is the adversary of God and he exists. We know Satan is the father of lies. And all who lie and serve lies are serving Satan personally. You don't have to have the dress in black and paint your fingernails black and wear the black eyeliner and eyeshadow to be a Satanist. You don't, have to, you don't have to have a pentagram tattoo in order to serve Satan. Now, don't get me wrong, he'll take that. He'll accept that. You can have the black Sabbath and the, the flaming pentagram. He'll do that. But that's not where Satan does most of his work. In fact, we can find out from Jesus' own words where Satan does most of his work. Starting in John chapter 8, if you have your Bible... <clears throat> Turn to John chapter 8, verse 31. And then Jesus said to those Jews who believed Him, and I have to stop right there and ask everyone, who is Jesus addressing here? Let me read it again. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed Him. So who's Jesus talking to? Those Jews who believed Him. It's not a trick question. right? He's talking to those Jews who believed Him. Well, let's read what Jesus said. Well, let's read what He had just told them before, back in verse 29. Jesus said, He who sent Me is with Me. The Father has not left Me alone. For I always do those things that please Him. And, he spoke, and as He spoke these words, many believed in Him. Many believed in Him when He spoke these words. So in verse 29, Jesus declared Himself the Son of God. That's what He just did. He declared Himself the Messiah that everyone was looking for. And John writes that as he spoke, many believed in him. But then the very next sentence appears to be directed to a different group of people. Not the people who believed in him as Messiah and wanted to worship him. Wanted to make him their king at least. Not those. The next sentence is addressed simply to those who believed him. Those who believed him that He was the Messiah. They believed Him, but they didn't believe in Him. They believed Him. Satan did not believe in Him, but Satan believed Him. Satan knew who He was. And because Satan believed Him, believed Him to be the Messiah, because of that, Satan wanted to kill Him. And so did others who believed Him. And I would contend... They were the chief priests. They were the, the one who called himself the high priest. They were the, the Sanhedrin, the political and religious leaders of the day. They believed him, but they did not believe in him. They wanted to kill him. Listen to what he says to them. And in verse 59, by the way, the end tells us that this particular section was delivered by Jesus in the temple. This is in the temple. So he is addressing the religious leaders here, more than likely to their face. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed Him, If you abide in My word, you are My disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. They answered Him, We are Abraham's descendants, and we have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus, Jesus answered them, Most assuredly I say to you, Whoever commits sin is a slave of sin, and a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me, because my word has no place in you. I speak what I have, been, I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have seen with your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me. A man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. 
Then they said to him, We were not born of fornication. We have one Father, God. Jesus said to them, If God were your Father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Nor have I come of myself, but He sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not, you are not able to listen to my word. You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. So here in John 8, Jesus had just established who his father was, and now he was establishing who the father of the Jewish religious leaders was. They were of their father, the devil. And just like their father, they believed him when he said he was Messiah, and they wanted to kill him for it. And, so, and this is in the temple to the religious leaders. Satan does most of his work inside the churches and inside the temples and the mosques and the monasteries and any other structure that's built by man that Satan can occupy and use to turn people away from the truth. And so it was that the office of high priest ordained by God for a time to bear witness to the sanctification of a place or, or for a feast, that office became a lifelong office like that of a king. And, and the, the social construct of chief priests grew up and basically became a, an office that would be utilized to accumulate and distribute power among the ambitious. But that is not how God established His church. I'm convinced that ultimate religious authority rests with no single man in God's church, at least no single earthly man, because God knows what we are. He knows that the heart of man is deceitful above all things. Think about what that means. Deceitful above all things can be taken to mean more deceitful than any other thing, but it also could be taken as Dis, the man, a man's heart is deceitful and wicked when set up in authority over anything, all things, over all things. So both sentiments are true. There's nothing more deceitful than the heart of man, and every single man given authority over anything tends toward deceit. And so God did not establish the papacy. I'm sorry. I'm not sorry. He didn't. And I don't think he has appointed the priest or even the pastor or the chief priest or Sceva here to be any singular authority in his church. I don't think so. Jesus Christ is anointed as the high priest, not for just a week, but after the order of Melchizedek. High priest forever. And as each priest was anointed for a specific purpose and for a specific time, I'm convinced that for the church today, each father is anointed to lead his household in the church while he abides as father over his wife and children. The father leads, the pastor teaches, the elders give counsel and advice, and the singers sing. But the head of the church is Christ, not the priest, not the chief priest, not the high priest, not the pastor, not the pope. Now, we'll return to Acts, um, and we are going to rejoin Acts in chapter 20, beginning in verse 21. When these things were accomplished, Paul purposed in the Spirit, when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, to go to Jerusalem, saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. So he sent into Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus, but he himself stayed in Asia for a time. And about that time there arose a great commotion about the way, for a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Diana, brought no small profit to the craftsmen. He called them together with the workers of similar occupation. He said, Men, you know that we have our prosperity by this trade. Moreover, you see and hear that not only at Ephesus, 
But throughout almost all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away many people, saying that they are not gods which are made with hands. So not only is this trade of ours in danger of falling into disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana may be despised, and her magnificence destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worship. Now when they heard this, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians! So the whole city was filled with confusion and rushed into the theater with one accord, having seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians, Paul's travel companions. And when Paul wanted to go into the people, the disciples would not allow him. Then some of the officials of Asia, who were his friends, sent to him pleading that he would not venture into the theater. And so Paul's determined, we read, to go to Rome. And now that he's made an appearance at the Areopagus at Athens, I think it's appropriate that he would go to Rome. Paul is now a headliner, so to speak. Um, So why not? Rome, you've gone to Athens, let's go to Rome. So it makes sense that Paul would venture from the seat of all earthly philosophy to the seat of uh, the singular authority of all political power on earth at the time, which was Rome, to go there and deliver the good news to the people being oppressed by that singular seat of political authority. Um, And despite what we're told about the glory of Rome, by the way, it was pretty brutal authority. Um, They perfected the art of crucifixion after all. And I'm sure one of the reasons the gospel spread so far and wide and so fast throughout the Roman Empire was at first, of course, it's the power of the story. It's the power of the story first. A loving God who created a perfect world only to see it corrupted by by a traitor. And then then that that all-powerful, all-knowing Creator sends His Son to offer His life as a ransom for those that the traitor sought to kill and capture. So that in and of itself is compelling. But the fact that most of the people who heard it were poor and oppressed, like just about everyone throughout of all of history, all the time, almost everyone, poor and oppressed. Uh, that's another reason the gospel spread. Because people were poor and oppressed, and they wanted some good news, and Paul was bringing them some good news. I mean, we, we, we can certainly consider ourselves to be blessed to have been born when and where we are, at least materially. But spiritually, I don't know. I mean, it, it's much more difficult to get wealthy, comfortable people, like the people of our generation, to even pay attention to the gospel. I mean, why do you need good news if you have a big screen TV and all the food you can eat and a comfortable bed and a roof over your house and more money than you can spend. and So it's a blessing and a curse, I suppose. And now here in Acts 19, by the way, speaking to that, material wealth, here we have the equivalent of the modern sports memorabilia merchants or maybe like religious booksellers. They're all upset that this new way is up upsetting their economic order. It's threatening their livelihood. It's threatening their... their uh, these are the wealthy people in the community. These are the, uh, the people who have money. They have trade. And, and so their livelihood is threatened. And make no mistake about it, when people fear for the loss of their livelihood, they get extremely agitated and unstable. It's well known that fear of loss is a more reliable motivator of human action than hope for gain. Fear of loss is a more reliable motivator of human action than hope for gain. The 2 Timothy 1.7 tells us God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. That's the believer. But the heathen craftsmen in Ephesus, they're not operating here in a sound mind. They're in fear. And where fear reigns, Chaos lurks just around the corner, just under the surface. And so let's finish this section, uh, starting in chapter 32. We're in the theater and there's pandemonium. 
Some therefore cried one thing, some another, for the assembly was confused, and most of them did not know why they had come together. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward, and Alexander motioned with his hand and wanted to make his defense of the people. But when they found out he was a Jew, all with one voice cried out for about two hours, Great is Diana of the Ephesians! Great is Diana! For about two hours. And when the city clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, what man is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is temple guardian of the great goddess Diana and of the image which fell down from Zeus? Therefore, since these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. For you have brought these men here who are neither robbers of temples nor blasphemers of your goddess. Therefore, if Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a case against anyone, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. Let them breed charges against one another. But if you have any other inquiry to make, it shall be determined in the lawful assembly. For we're in danger of being called into question for today's uproar, there being no reason which we may give to account for this disorderly gathering. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. And apparently they went home. That's the end of the chapter. (laughs) And so Alexander, by the way, here, he appears to be a Jewish silversmith, probably a member of the same trade guild as Demetrius the silversmith who who kind of started all this commotion and it's possible that someone in the crowd thought that a Jewish silversmith might be able to calm things down but the heathens they they still all looked at all Jews the same whether you were a believer whether you were of this way or that way you were just a Jew they knew it was the Jews preaching this new way and so then they just pretty much lost their minds and went into a chant for a couple of hours. And then it's, I find it interesting that the, the, the city clerk ends up calming everyone down, oddly enough, and he starts by reminding everyone, don't worry, the Denver Broncos still reign supreme. Don't worry about this new, I'm sorry, the great goddess Diana. It's still, she still reigns. She's not threatened by these preachers. Uh, and then he reminds them that Rome is still in authority, by the way. And they better lay off or there are going to be repercussions from upstairs, meaning Rome. And for, basically, for a, a, we're about to have a riot here, and the Romans are they're famous for putting down riots, and they're not friendly about it. And so, again, fear of loss is a, is a better motivator of human action, a more reliable motivator of human action than hope of gain. And so they fear Rome, and so he dispatches them. <laughs> and so, apparently, God needs Paul in Rome. It seems that Paul was led by the Spirit and and by some of his brethren here not to make his usual speech before this particular crowd. Because it might have ended in another stoning or death or even worse for the brethren there. Um, But it seems that the Spirit may have had a purpose in showing Alexander the depravity of the unbelieving Ephesians. There may be something there. But for more on that, we'll have to wait until we study Paul's letters to Timothy, which I hope we get a chance to do. Lord willing, we will read, we'll eventually study the whole Bible. And until next time, may God bless you. May He make His face to shine upon you. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank You for Paul's message, for the good news. We ask that despite the fact that we are comfortable and that we have little to worry about in the here in the physical realm, Lord, that You would... Keep our spirits attentive to you that we might seek to know you better and especially, Lord, to tell other people about you. We ask for your grace, for your wisdom, and the power of your spirit in our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.